just going to formally open it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're being recorded, as you may know. Um, this is the Central Business Architecture Committee meeting on Tuesday, June 4th, 2019. Um, there's only one item on the agenda. Uh, there does not appear to be any public comment, so we'll move forward into discussions with Dodson Flinker regarding proposed form-based code modifications for downtown and Florence Center. So if you could start by introducing yourselves and go from there. I'm Peter Flinker. This is Dylan Sussman. Hi. Um, I'm with Dodson Flinker, of course, in Florence. Dylan joined us last summer and was involved in some of the workshops we did last. So I, I already, I'm sorry, if you could just try and speak up a little bit. Sorry, um, so Dylan and I were both involved in some workshops we did last fall. Um, we had a public workshop in October mm -hmm. to talk about the form-based code and, and uh, more broadly we realized that a lot of decisions that have to go into the form-based code haven't really been made. Um, and so we've also been working especially in Florence, on a, a downtown plan. We had a workshop last fall, and over the next couple of weeks, going to be rolling out some ideas for the, the Florence plan, and then hopefully moving into uh, some code revisions for Florence. Um, in Northampton, of course, we're sort of further along in terms of the plan. It's kind of more about preservation of the existing character. And how many of you were at our public forum in the fall? Pretty sure I was at one of them. But you I were there. I was at one of them. Yeah, yeah. I think we 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 also did a like a presentation at the DNA. And I think you guys were both there. Presentation at at the the DNA, the oh, okay. Downtown Northampton Association. I'm just not sure, but I, w I remember is that the um the one at the train station. Yeah. Was that yeah. that was it? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of good feedback and. Um, so where we are now is sort of putting together the final draft of a form-based code for consideration. And uh, so we've really been hoping since last fall to meet with you and talk about um, how this committee fits into that now and in the future. And uh, so Dylan is gonna sort of go through where we are to date and then we have sort of some key questions that we'd like to hear from you. Uh, but we're hoping to keep this informal and have a dialogue and um, you can tell us what you think is important rather than us telling you. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we're here tonight because um, so the, the idea is to do a form-based code that would replace, the original idea was to do a form-based code for downtown Northampton and it would replace the central business district zoning um, and also the entrance business zoning and the general business on Pleasant and the South End of Con Street. Um, and so that obviously relates to what you all do because um, your, your sort of authorization is tied into the central business district. Um, so there are a couple of key questions for tonight. Um, that's what we've done. So a couple of key questions for tonight is whether it makes sense to adjust the the boundaries of your jurisdiction. So the central business district has grown over the years um, and has been clearly an effective tool. Um, but the question is, with a, with a new <coughs> style of zoning that's kind of more effective at doing the kinds of things that your guidelines do, does it make sense to change your boundaries, whether to shrink them or expand them? Um, so that's the first question. The second question is, which of the architectural standards that are in your guidelines are the most important to incorporate into a form-based code for other parts of Northampton? So that would be the entrance way business district or the general business district on Pleasants and Cons, or maybe into Florence as well. We heard a lot of um, a lot of strong opinions about design in Florence. So historically, Florence apparently has been opposed to having design guidelines, but it seems like at this point people are more interested in them. Um, so of what you guys have, what would be good to incorporate into a form-based code? And we've already incorporated pretty much most of what you have. Um, so you can tell us what doesn't belong or if there are things that are missing. Uh, so then the other thing is, what standards in the current zoning 
should be more flexible than the other parts of downtown. Um, and then the final question is, what's missing from your guidelines? Are there any things? I know you've, you've gone through and reviewed your guidelines um, and made some updates about a year ago that are sort of under consideration. So I wanted to go back and just ask if there was anything that you guys know is, is missing, you know, that applicants come to you and you, they consistently are making up some mistake that's not called out in the guidelines um, or something you feel like should be added. So this is the project area. Um, so that's an aerial photo. At the, at the top there's, um, there's King Street basically running from north to south and then Pleasant Street on the bottom half and in the middle is the central business district where King Street running basically east and west. Just for fun. So we have this nice floor space. For reference purposes. And Peter, here's a bulletin board too, if you need it. Huh. Well, we'll play it by ear. <laughs> okay. Um, so the entrance business district on King Street runs from basically just uh, south of the bike path crossing. I'm sorry, I missed what you just said. Entrance business on King Street runs from across from Acme Automotive mm -hmm. down to um, Summer Street, North Street. And then you know what the CBD is, I assume, because you work there. And then the general business district goes from Michaelman Ave and Holyoke Street down to anybody else see the hands? Down to um, where the levee crosses, and then it goes a little the way up Con Street to um, the Gazette building. <coughs> so that's the area under consideration. Would you mind just taking a step back and helping me understand a little bit better what you're describing as form-based yes. code? Because this is not official yet. This is no. a concept that you're working on, right. correct? Yeah, it's a zoning proposal that the city has hired us to work on. And I, yeah, I'm going to get to that. OK. Yeah. Um, so that's this is the existing zoning map. Um, where you can see the central business district is the, the right in the middle. I've probably changed the colors a little bit from what you're familiar with. Um, the pink at the top is that entrance or business. And then you see how there's a modeling of colors on the southern end. The, the darker pink is the general business district that's in the proposal. And then all the orange and the light pink are URC and neighborhood business and um, so on. So it's a, it's a mixed. It's a mix of districts on the side of the um, This is showing the, how the central business district has changed over time. So, how am I going to? We have a printout of this, it might make it easier to see. So, this is the Vertical hatch here is the original central business district. And in, um, 2000 and, and in 2004, this area here was added, sort of just a little strip on the north end. Um, Talbots and post office, and that area was added in 1999. Um, the multifamily condo complex or whatever on Gothic Street was added, and then along State Street here was added, and the Michaelman Ave down the Holyoke Street was added in 1999. And then in 2000, the district picked up Forbes Library and the parking garage at Smith, and the area between Trumbull Road and Summer Street on King Street, and then a little of the a bit of Holly Street over here. Um, and some of, the, this is the church on Holly Street. So going back on the back of Phillips and here in Holly. Um, and then also a little bit of 
Con Streets, the north end of Con Streets. And this is the, the Dairy Mart and then a couple of um, houses down below that. So the question is, so going back to that question of should the district's boundaries remain the way they are now, um, I think our working assumption was that the district was expanding in part because there it had some unique characteristics that the rest of the zoning didn't have in that it could regulate design. Um, also, it doesn't require parking, which is a big thing. Um, but on the design side, a form-based code, which I'll get into, has the ability to regulate design as well. So the question is, does the sort of rigorous, um, largely historic-based negotiated design review process that you all go through, um, is that the best tool for those later additions to the district? Um, and is it or not? Um, and if it's not, what standards would be necessary to incorporate into a form-based code? Um, or should it be expanded? And I think just on the expanded side, I think that the, what we've heard so far is that there's probably not much appetite in the city for expanding that jurisdiction. Um, I think this city in general is trying to go towards more sort of like streamlined and predictable review of permits, which is part of the reason for doing form-based code, which is more prescriptive and tells a developer one applicant what the city wants so they can just do it right the first time. Right. However, the reason we're asking this question is that what we've realized is that a lot of the places where change is likely is not right on Main Street, but it's in these areas like Hawley Street, Conn Street, and some of these other back, back streets where change is likely to happen. And right now there's, um, those aren't necessarily all part of the, the core commercial districts, for one thing, and also they're not all part of your jurisdiction. So it's, we're not gonna resolve that tonight, but these are questions that we want to talk about. But right. those, those areas are more typically eclectic in right. their design at this point. Yeah. And you know, I think Obviously, the, the central business, our purview has been the, the main street areas that are highly visible mm -hmm. to you know, pedestrian traffic or whatever. So, <clears throat> like you mentioned, some people question more regulation. I mean, to try to put regulations, and I'm not sure if you're talking about strictly building aesthetics and developing a prescriptive method or just some general overviews of what should happen to these areas as they start to change <clears throat> and get more developed. Right. Well, that's what Dylan's going to show is some of the, the preliminary graphics that we've developed are really based on your current uh, regulations. And they're basically just making it more visible so people can understand what's going on. But by doing that, you also see where the gaps are, the things that aren't really discussed. And you probably have more familiar with that because that's where people come with something they think meets the guidelines and you say, no, that doesn't. And so maybe it needs to be more explicitly stated what the city's looking for. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So what we heard so far at these meetings that you all went to in a public forum and also a focus group at the Chamber of Commerce. So about the downtown, it's what you would expect. People generally love it. They love the historic architecture. They love the wide sidewalks and the active street life, the Pulaski Park. Um, people are concerned about traffic safety, especially bike safety downtown. And that's both on Main Street and on the streets that feed into Main Street. Um, they're concerned about panhandling and homelessness and signs of social distress. Um, they're concerned about housing affordability. They're concerned about retail and what's going to happen to downtown when, when the shift towards internet you know, purchasing continues. What will happen with the storefronts? Will we have enough businesses to fill them? Um, and so the, the design directions that have come out of both our work and what we've heard is that for for Main Street, um, it seems like the the building pattern is quite set, the architectural pattern is quite set, and the opportunity for improvement is really in the public what we call the public realm, which is the space between the buildings. So everything from 
essentially the front of, the, of one building on one side of the street to the front of the other side of the building on the other side of the street, um, which is both sort of Northampton's competitive edge, right? Or was Northampton's competitive edge when there weren't other awesome main streets out there? Um, but now that other towns have been revitalizing their main streets and putting in better streetscapes, Northampton's starting to look a little bit tired um, and also has these conflicts around, around different users. Northampton's starting different. to look a little bit what? Tired. A little tired. Tired. You know, we've got cracked bricks and trees that aren't thriving. It's an elegant shabbiness, mm -hmm. perhaps. But I mean, to your question about what a form-based code is, one of the things that's special about a form-based code is that it, it treats the public realm of the street and the sidewalks and the front yards as part of uh, the, the design equation, essentially. Whereas traditional zoning is mostly about the private property. A form-based code sort of treats everything that you can see, public and the private, as one composition. But you're trying to influence an aesthetic, really. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you're trying to create an urban place. You're trying to shape space. Or has, preserve an urban place. Which has an aesthetic component. So a traditional zoning, we call Euclidean zoning, is really focused on use and separation of uses. That's what it was set up to do. It was set up to separate the residences from the factories and the sort of treatment plants. Um, and it did that well. And it split apart communities so that you have you have um, neighborhoods of houses, and you have places where you shop, and places where you work. Um, that kind of zoning doesn't work as well when you want to have a mixed-use, walkable environment. And so Northampton, over the years, has been sort of moving away from that separation of uses, allowing mixed uses, promoting mixed uses, reducing parking requirements, doing all kinds of things that essentially in line with what we call a form-based code or a context-based code, which is more about how it's less about separation of uses and it's more about um, how buildings shape public space um, and how they relate to each other, which is, so it's, it's essentially much more focused on the pedestrian experience or the user experience as opposed to um, and everything that's happening between the buildings as opposed to what's happening within the buildings. Right, so traditionally a form-based code doesn't worry about uses, but they do typically say that on the front, on the main floor facing the street or the sidewalk, you want to have active uses, shops and restaurants and things where you can look in and see what's going on. And you typically want to discourage residential blank, you know, curtain-covered windows with residences or offices, those kind of things. But so is form-based code really about use and not so much about specific architectural aesthetics? No, or quite about it's use exactly and buildings? The it's exactly the opposite of what he's saying. It's not about use at all. It's about how things look. Right. Yeah. I think I'll skip over the summary here and just go to what a form-based code is. So then we can go back to the summary. So this is... <clears throat> This is a draft of a proposed map for, um, for this area. And so it, it maintains the three, the three districts, although they're now called sub-districts. They're all part of one district, and they have different characteristics within them. Um, and then the black lines on there, the different dotted black lines, are different street types. So there's the Main Street Primary, which is our Main Street. And then there's Main Street Secondary, which is um, Pleasant Street and King Street within the CBD. Um, and then there's a side street type, and then there's a gateway type, which covers lower Pleasant Street and um, Middle, King, Middle King Street. Um, and the reason those are divided into street types is it's basically the approach with a firm based code is you take the built environment and you slice it and dice it into different pieces. So you take the streets and you slice those into different street types. And you take the buildings and you slice those into different building types. Um, and the, the power of doing that is then you have sort of a kit of parts that you can be a little bit more prescriptive about what you want where. So you say, 
this is a side street here, and the characteristics of a side street that we want will be that it has um, a five foot sidewalk and a three foot strip between the sidewalk and the curb, and a two foot strip between the back of the sidewalk, the, or the front of the sidewalk, the building side of the sidewalk, and the front of the building. And it'll have street trees every so often. Um, and you, so you can get more prescriptive about it, so that when the applicant comes, you say, you look at our zoning, when you improve your, your, the public area in front of your building to bring it up to spec, this is what it's going to look like. Um, likewise, with building types, you could say, um, in one part of Northampton, maybe uh, single family houses are appropriate and the only thing that's appropriate. In another part of Northampton, maybe um, stacked flats, in other words, apartments that are stacked on top of each other are appropriate, and row houses are appropriate, and mixed use buildings with ground floor commercial and apartments above are appropriate. So you can get more prescriptive or more, more directive and clear about what you want. So, so this is an illustration of, of um, the main street street type. And the colored bars there are showing the, the different areas within that street and then there are standards associated with those areas like widths and what kinds of things are appropriate to go in them. Um, so. All right, so for each, we have like four or five different street types. And so for each street type, there's a, a breakdown of what we call the throughway and the frontage, the various frontage zones. So the idea is that when the developer comes forward or anywhere, the city's redesigning the street, it's very clear what you want to have happen so that the whole thing has a consistent treatment. So in this particular example, there's the, the A zone there is the throughway, which needs to be a certain width of 5 to 12 feet to maintain access for people walking through. There's an area B, which is the, the frontage zone next to the building, which could be used for certain displays, the awnings, planters, perhaps an outdoor shopping table or so on. And so it makes it very clear which areas have to remain clear and which areas the business can use for its own purposes or even just to have available for the sweep of the door opening. And so basically it's, it's taking a lot of stuff which is already there and in place but making it clear how it fits into this overall pattern for each street type then. Yeah, and Bob's trip to Amsterdam is a perfect example of like we're trying to get rid of the shabbiness and make things have more clarity. And just like Amsterdam, you just can see where the bike lanes are. Now here you're defining where the bike lanes are and they have certain, Europe has certain ways about it. You know, the, the, the paint, the chicanes, the, everything just, it, it's, it's really distinct and it's, it's welcoming pedestrians. And it sounds like this form based thing is for pedestrians and kind of phasing out the CBAC zone, which is focusing on architecture, basically. So you're trying to combine pedestrian, vehicular, and the existing architecture, right. and combine well, all those guidelines. Yeah. I mean, regardless of the level of participation of CBAC, you're basically trying to then unite the public realm with the private realm. Yeah, I wouldn't say yeah. phasing out. I think that the same, it's the same kind of logic that, that is behind the design guidelines, which is to look at what exists and what people love and what's great and figure out the principles that are underlying that and then write them down on paper so that people can follow them in the future. Right? So we look at Main Street and we see what it is that people love about Main Street and then distill the principles and try to apply them for the future. To me, it's like we're, we're on two different planes, though, because you're talking about urban planning. Yes. And this committee is really talking about aesthetics, of architectural aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, they can be combined, but yeah. I think there's a need for both. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so, just, I'm going to go through this quickly. So, here's a, these are the other parts of the sidewalk. Here's another 
type of street. This is uh, a narrower street, you can see. That's more like a uh, center street or Pleasant Street. Sorry, this, this one here is Center Street. The last one is Pleasant Street. Um, so we deal with streets. We deal with things like street trees and tree pits, getting into detail on those, right? Where cafe seating can belong. We're still in the public realm here. OK, now we're moving out to the kind of district level and also the building level. So um, if you remember back to the map that had different colors of pink and there was this central business district and essentially entrance and, and the, the gateway districts. So this is the, the basic table that um, would be the controlling element in the form base code. So it has an intent statement that describes what the central business subdistrict is like. It has an illustration that shows you what we want it to be like, which is essentially what it is now. Um, and then it has a, a bunch of boxes in the table there for different kinds of standards. Right? There's the type of standard, and then there's what the criteria is. Um, and it covers things like lot sizes and building heights um, and setbacks, the kinds of things that are in normal zoning. And it also covers things like, um, like how much glazing is required on the first floor and the upper floors, the kind of things that are in your standards that are not typically in zoning. Um, it also covers things like roof slopes and different roof types and what's allowed there. Um, or building types, like I mentioned earlier. Um, it gets into so basic lot standards. Um, more detail on height than, or more illustrations on height than what's in the current zoning. So what are acceptable ground floor elevations? This isn't so much of an issue in, North, in downtown Northampton. It is an issue in Florence where one side of the street, um, the elevation is a couple feet higher when you go back into the lots than, than the street level. And so you get all these um, odd transitions between the sidewalk and the front of the building. Where either there's a handicap ramp or there are a couple steps. Um, storefront windows end up being higher than you would like because the ground floor elevation is higher. So that sort of thing, there's possibility of establishing step backs on buildings. Um, so if you go above a certain height, you would step back the upper floors. That might be appropriate for somewhere like, it would be appropriate for a narrow street, right? It's not appropriate for a main street where you've got 108 feet of width. Um, so you're never going to reach a point where you're going to feel claustrophobic on that street. Um, but a more narrow street somewhere else in North Angeles, you might reach that point. You get into building heights, you get into facade types. It's essentially what's happening on, on the front of the building, especially on the first floor. Does it have a shop front? Does it have an office front? Does it have a door that empties right out from the sidewalk? Does it have a stoop? Does it have a porch? Um, and again, these things are all sliced and diced so that later on you can go back and say, something's appropriate somewhere, but something else is not appropriate somewhere else. So shop fronts. Basically, Main Street, we want nothing but shop fronts, right? Um, <clears throat> common doorways would not be allowed on, on Main Street unless it's associated with a shop front. Stoops probably aren't going to be allowed on Main Street. But there are other parts of town where maybe a shop front would not be appropriate, and a stoop would be appropriate. Um, are, are some of these things going to be grandfathered in? or? Do we have to take out these things that you're describing? <laughs> yeah, it's zoning, so it's all grandfathered. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Um, so then there are frontage types, which is that space between the building and the edge of, of the right of way. Um, building components, things like bedding windows, turrets, blasters, columns. Then we get into architectural standards. So this is where we're starting those last couple slides, and now we're getting into your realm, right? right? We've moved from the public realm, from the streets, into lot, how lots are laid out and massing, um, into the basic configurations of the buildings, and now we're starting into the architectural details of 
you know, the width of the building relative to the height, um, the, the, the subdivisions of that facade, um, the elements of the facade, wanting lintels and sills and cornices and so on. Um, these are standards that are more general than probably what are in your, your guidelines right now, but might apply elsewhere in Northampton. So just simply saying that you have to have some sort of modulation to your facade, um, that it can't be one long thing if it's over a certain length. Mm. So say your building's over 50 feet, it has to have some sort of, um, some sort of modulation of the facade, some sort of sense of, uh, of that building being broken, the facade being broken down into smaller elements, whether it's equally divided or has a central component or ends that are emphasized. Um, and the same thing for horizontal articulation, having a, a clear base, middle, and top to the building. And setting limitations on, on the size of allowable blank walls per floor. Is that is that diagram showing what would be considered allowable in terms of a blank wall? No, that would be un unallowed. Oh, okay. Disallowed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's usually listed as a percentage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no more than X percentage of the the floor. Right. Be blank. So that previous one that had the table for the district with mm -hmm. all the little numbers, mm -hmm. that sort of fills in the blanks that these illustrate. So you would say, here's, here's an illustration of what constitutes a blank wall, and the table says how much of a percentage you can have that's blank wall. So you can sort of customize for even each street how much blank wall you can have, how much transparent fenestration you have on the first floor, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, so the other big advantage of a form-based code is that it's all illustrated with diagrams so people can very clearly see what you need. Um, and then, but it does have the numbers in the tables that say what the standard should be for each area. Yeah, so at downtown Florence or downtown Northampton, you probably want to have a pretty low percentage of blank wall in an area that's more industrial focused or even you know, lower cons where you have the exact building, you've got a big, gigantic blank wall. Um, but if you want to have those kinds of uses, you have to allow Greater, greater amount of blank walls. Is there an option to request variances on some of these items? Is that as part of the form base code? Yeah, that's something we could write on. Oh, sorry, I missed that. I was asking if there's an option to ask for variances, like if there's a particular, you know, uh, owner of a building that wants to put in a specialty business that requires less windows yeah they ask be, for a variance more likely a special permit than a variance but yes yeah yeah it's like any other kind of zoning you can set it up so that the things that you want everybody to do are required mm -hmm. and other things you either you give them a range say if you want it to be between a certain amount of high and low percentage Right. And then as long as they're within that range, it works, or you say you can apply for a variance or a waiver. And I think you could set it up, and one of the things that we had talked about was, um, you know, maybe um, the range is allowed with, in a certain um, core district or even a sub-district by review from the CBAC. I'm sorry. Um, that perhaps maybe if there, you know, there's a prescriptive standard, so if you build according to the design um, criteria or the form um, and the code that you would just get your permit. But if you your project varied from that, you would that might trigger a review by Central Business Architecture Committee in some portions of downtown and maybe in other portions it's just planning board depending on where the district is so that's an that's sort of one of the other questions is sort of right. deciding it does it make sense to have um a central business architecture committee review um certain sections only and have planning board do other sections or you know expand um, jurisdiction uh, so that's part of the equation yeah, I mean, the fundamental, like the philosophical question here is, 
is it possible to produce a cookbook that gets the results that are adequate for the central business district? Or does it require <coughs> the negotiation and many eyes looking at a product? We, and those, particularly the way we, when we went through our, our cookbook and we revised <coughs> it and we put a lot more illustrations in it and it deals with a lot of the things you're talking about. <coughs> yeah. Right? Um, That's are, because we took them from you. Right. But are you <laughs> are you hoping to come out of this meeting with with definite answers to your specific questions about um, I think that, you know, as, as definite as we can get it's helpful, but uh, there's always room for more conversation. Yeah. I think a cookbook would work. And I think cuz it would reduce any kind of subjectivity, you know, if that's a concern of people's. But uh, I'm completely open to it. I think it's it's easy, and then I like what you just proposed um, that um, if they apply for a variance or you know whatever, then they would come to the committee. That makes a lot of sense to me. Well, I think that's an interesting somebody, process. Who knows how many others that would be? As somebody who sat on this committee from the very beginning. I would say the chance, the times that people have brought projects to us that didn't have some odd um, mm. feature are, um, you know, so that we could just say, yeah, this fits the cookbook, go for it. That was maybe 10% of the projects, maybe 20% mm -hmm. of the projects, but most of the time there's something we have to talk about. Yeah. And, you know, and, and <clears throat> If you look at if you look at all the great buildings that are downtown, and then you wanted to to write a cookbook about what's good, it's almost impossible because there's so many buildings that are that defy all the other rules that the other buildings um, conform to, but it's but they still work. So we you know it, we definitely have to you know we have to have the cookbook, the guide for people, but you know 75 percent of the time we're going to be in the negotiation with the developer. It's, it's, that's just the way it, it works. And, and I think it's worked pretty well, actually, because we, you know, we've improved a lot of the projects that um, have come before us. So if somebody follows the cookbook, who's reviewing the design to confirm? Well, it, would like it would be a staff level review. Yeah. OK. So you. Uh, or the or building inspector? Um, I don't think we do. I don't think the building inspector would be the right person to review that just because they have all those other right. aspects that they yeah. have to review. Um, well, we've I don't know that we've thought that yeah. level at that level of detail of who would who the staff is that would be reviewing it. Yeah. Um, we get staff recommendations for every project that comes before us. Exactly. Right. And so I think the so I think the question would be I mean some of these things are pretty I think you can define you know you can calculate what percentage of the um, glazing there is on the building um, pretty easily I think what or what you know detailing or elements are included I think um, definitely our city solicitor has um, stated many times on other projects, not just reviewing this, that if there is any element of subjectivity in an analysis, that um, he, his recommendation is that that gets put to a board. So I think to the extent that you know, and there at, at some level there's going to be a gray area about what's subjective and what's not. But I think the really, truly subjective um, elements would need some kind of review, whether it's central business or planning board. And that's certainly been the take of the city solicitors. I think this would be very difficult to incorporate in a village like Florence, which is so highly eclectic now. I mean, the main street of Florence isn't that big. I mean, basically it goes from Chestnut Street to just past Maple. You got six blocks there, but the amount of setbacks and totally eclectic architecture, you know, I think 
one, you might run into a lot of public dissent on trying to regulate that. But the planning you're talking about is something that has to be put in place and it would take like hundreds of years until those buildings are phased out and replaced with something conforming to this new code. I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to make trouble here. I'm just saying it's such a difficult area. You know, I mean, to me, Florence has always been like a mess. You know, I mean, yeah. like they just threw that couple of farms in there. I'm really surprised people didn't complain about that. You have this huge gas station in the middle of a Main Street area that the kind, the cookie cutter buildings that they typically put on a main, tra you know, highway for traffic. And, you know, you've got the old bank that's the pizza, pa the pizza parlor and the, the gas station. And, you know, it's, it's so eclectic. Right. I, I would find it would be really hard to regulate it. Well, it's it's eclectic, but there is a historic. The historic buildings all follow the traditional pattern. Well, three of them. <laughs> I mean, it's like well, I mean, between the between bird the, building and the old people's everybody's well, market is one. Well, like, it's it's partly the history of, of course. Traditionally, I mean, historically, most of the commercial stuff was on Maple Street. Yeah. Oh, going, right. Going down to the depot, and there were big single-family houses essentially on most of Main Street, except for where the mills are. And then when those houses got torn down back in the 40s and 50s, they built those ugly free for all. <laughs> good. Well, but but the, the good news is that the you know Florence Pizza, the Friendlies building, the well the new building that we need. most most of the buildings that are new and are not really compatible with the historic character are not in great shape. Yeah, they won't last. And they're also they're they're not very years, valuable so to them. Right. They're not valuable to their owners. So the idea there is that we're trying to come up with a vision of sort of bringing it to what it should be, which is more of a consistent streetscape with buildings closer to the sidewalk, beautiful, well-designed public spaces, etc. cetera, um, continuous planting of street trees, just a beautiful place where people to hang out. So everyone will go from downtown Northampton to Florence <laughs> to hang out because it's going to be so beautiful. But we're hoping that this vision will inspire the landowners to say, hey, I should tear down this ugly building and I can make more money and have a beautiful building that's doing what the city wants. So I, I think it could happen as the market Yeah, And the bar is probably fairly fairly soon. in Florence, right? So in Northampton, we're looking, downtown Northampton, we're looking for a high level of refinement of architectural design, right? We're looking for a... A high level of refined architectural design. In Florence, if you can get the basic relationship between the building and the, and the street correct, and the basic building type correct, we're going to have an improvement. If we can improve the architecture on top of that, then we've got a home run. And yeah, it'll take a long time, but that's, that's the game with zone. It takes a long time to make change. Um, but if it's not there, then it becomes a hodgepodge. Of I, if, if we're, could we talk about the questions you want us to yes. answer? Because it's already yeah, sure. almost yeah. an hour into our meeting, yes. and it yep. seems like if that, if this is what it's for, it would be useful to um, yeah. have, yes. have that discussion as yeah. opposed to Florence, which we have no purview over. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know it's. It, no, it's real. Right. Right. You're uh, I don't take your own mind either. <laughs> yeah, and, and I. Well, I'm not going to apologize for giving you. An explanation of what form based codes no, are. No, no, I sure. needed to hear that. Yeah, I think you need to hear it to be able to decide whether it's something that you could potentially be comfortable enough with when you see all the details to think about where your jurisdiction belongs. So, again, going back to the map of, of CBD and thinking about what's been added. So, I want to walk through some of the areas that have been, have been added. So, this is uh, King Street. King Street. Right, and it's the it's the portion that was added in the most recent zoning change, and there's been a fair amount of activity here that I think you all have have been reviewing and have made a positive impact on. Um, it's it's different from the original core of Main Street, right, in that it doesn't have those theme commercial buildings. Um, it's much more of the transitional residential type. Um, so in that way, it's more like some of the side streets downtown. Um, so the question is, does this, does it make sense to keep this in your jurisdiction, or does it not? 
Um, if you move up the street, this is crossing out of central business now into entranceway business. You can see there's a pretty clear dividing line there. You're now into one story, predominantly one story commercial buildings. Um, there's some residential mixed in there. That was somewhere on North Street. Moving further up, got the gigantic empty old Honda lot. Time to retire some remnant residential buildings up there. And then beyond that, you're fully into King Street and Highway business. So the question is, does this belong? I don't, I don't know that anybody would argue that this belongs in central business. Um, would you be comfortable having this transition to form-based code? And would you be comfortable having this transition to form-based code? Or should this remain in central business? I guess I'm not completely clear on, on so are you suggesting that there's two separate codes, that there's a central business architecture guideline like we have now, and that there's a form-based code that is in other areas? Or are you talking about a form-based code that incorporates mm -hmm. the central business architecture guidelines? Well, you're, you're, so right now there's the zoning. Yes. And the form-based code would replace the zoning. You guys are a separate thing, and that would remain. Um, and so the question is, which areas of the new zoning should your committee be applied to? Because right? you're a separate ordinance. So school power. Is, is what's at stake here, if we go to form-based co form code, then the streetscape things that you're talking about will automatically apply to everywhere in the central business district. Right. Yep. And um, which seems fine to me, but we probably um, uh, we don't. Well, if um, I, I would have no problem with having with uh, with adding all of these streetscape things that you're talking about into the central business mm -hmm. district code. Obviously, there's you're going to be constrained by what's already in existence, but. Right. I'm particularly with this view. You you know, as these buildings age and as the the property owners see the potential for making more money by having a, a more commercial building, we want to encourage this part of King Street to become more integrated with the downtown. Right. North of Summer Street, I don't I don't think it's realistic to think about this at this point in time. And you know, so in terms of do we want to impose central business central business kind of conditions on the people that are going to buy the Honda lot? No, I don't think we want to do that. It's it's I not realistic. It it's too far away from downtown. Okay, I'm just thinking that you're. I'm sorry. You could be losing an opportunity though to help shape what it looks like. But it's too far from downtown. Mm -hmm. It's it's really you know it's it's like. To think that that's going to become part of the downtown by imposing this kind of restriction on that property, I, I don't think it's uh, it's just not being realistic about what somebody's likely to want to do there. Mm -hmm. You know, the chance that somebody's going to want to put up a theme building, you know, uh, uh, in the where you know north of Foster Ferrar, it just it doesn't. It just doesn't really make sense. In this part of King Street, absolutely it would make sense. Well, there may also be sort of taking that to the next step. I think the other um, piece or part of the puzzle is trying to figure out maybe for the streetscape, maybe it makes sense to have form-based code all the way up beyond the Honda lot, you know, to the bike path, but maybe the design criteria aren't applicable in that portion of the central business district. Maybe the, the uh, jurisdiction for specific architectural standards are only in the core downtown. So there could be sub-districts of this form-based code where you're treating the streets differently, but you still have elements of form because you want the buildings to develop and you want the Honda site to develop to the right. you know greatest extent possible. So I think that's another way you could look at it, and I think that's another piece that we want to make sure that we're 
keeping in mind to think, does it make sense? Are there you know, blocks that have a different you know, characteristic and shouldn't be in central business architecture purview for reviewing well, and I, are there others that should to be? Think about, like, to think about, well, whoever buys the Honda lot, to think about, well, the parking has to be behind the building. That's you're just you're just taking all kinds of stuff off the table that could be a realistic option for developing that lot. And I um, and it's far enough away from the from the current downtown that I don't have a problem with that. Um, it is part of the gateway I, with allowing parking in front of the building. But in terms of urban planning, I mean, I think what this is about is long-term development. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you want to create a corridor with a certain amount of setbacks from the curb or from the street that will be maintained in the future, so that you're creating some uniform feeling. Right. And it's, it's always it's an unknown. I mean, we don't know how much development's going to go on in Northampton. Mm -hmm. I mean. Would that behind the lot and all the way down, you know, to the banks and the other car things ever become a car? Like I think what Joe's saying, I don't think we see it going much past like Summer Street in that intersection. And you know? currently, that our district does not go past that. Right. 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 But we have another district that requires buildings to be up to the street and parking in the rear. And I would actually counter your argument and say that because that's Flanked by residential dense residential neighborhoods. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I would counter your statement about that it's not appropriate to require parking behind buildings in that in that section of King Street, noting that there are dense residential neighborhoods on either side of that that creates the potential for pedestrian activity in that corridor. So flanking the streets with buildings creates a safer space and a more inviting space for those people to access you know, buildings up and down in that section, and you've got the bike path on the back side. So there's a lot of potential, I think, up to that point where the bike path crosses. I think that is, you definitely sort of have much bigger lots and more. McDowell's and whatever. Right, yeah. Urban Suburban so. Sprawl. Right. But so is the question to add what's the gateway to central business or to leave it as the gateway? District. I think the current proposal, it's kind of like splitting hairs, but they're the entranceway business district and the central business district and what's currently general business would become one district, but within that there'd be sub-districts. And so the portion that's currently central business district would still be tied to your, your review. Um, entranceway business would get public realm standards and it would probably get some basic, it would get more building standards um, and other standards. It may or may not have architectural standards. And those architectural standards can be anywhere from just some of what you guys have to all of what you have. Right? There are a lot of questions left to be worked out. I think, um, I think the question is, my question for tonight is really just this, this portion here of Trumbull Road to Summer Street, do you feel like you guys are you're doing good work there and it should stay in your jurisdiction or or not? Like My you know, so it, so it, it should stay with our purview. And I think the real question there is with those themed commercial buildings is the kind of mixed-use building on Main Street, the only kind of mixed-use building that's appropriate in Northampton, right? It's a very, it's a very, there's some very specific historic architectural details called out in your guidelines. Do we want to requ require, what do they describe it as, like, pendant-like corbeling? Require what? Pendant-like corbeling, is that the term that's in the, uh, the yeah. guidance? So yeah. basically how you deal with cornice. Yeah, you're saying right? a theme building. Yeah, for a theme building, is should that be required here on King Street when it's not necessary. It wasn't ever part of the historic theme building core of, of Northampton. Mm -hmm. 
Because the, the what about um, Live 155 and then the new building right across the street that's got that really nice courtyard? I envision something like that over there, even, you know, and that's that's not necessarily a theme building. Those those aren't theme buildings. Yeah. Live 155 is. 155 yeah. would be a oh, theme building. Oh, well, the yeah. other one too. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And I would argue that in this section of King Street, Lower King Street, we should encourage that type yeah. of development. I yeah. would, I, I would be, I, if somebody, if somebody came to us with a project that didn't have, <clears throat> you know, the theme, the calling the theme building look, I would certainly consider it, and I would, I would feel um, much more inclined to be flexible here than I would be if somebody wanted to. Put a second and third and fourth floor above faces or where faces was in terms of what it would look like. Right. But um, but I think we should encourage the kind of cookbook standards that we have on Lower King Street mm -hmm. going up to um, Summer Street. going up to Summer Street. I think that makes sense. So okay, so I'm not hearing any of the rest of you saying no, so I'm going to sort of take that as a, as a consensus and move on. No, and I think it's a good example of talking about Live 155 and also the Lumberyard development. The Lumberyard development is the tallest building in that area, except for one that's right across the street. And that does sort of define the corridor and entry into the central business. And I think on the flip side, it makes sense to do that. I think the goal would be to um, to strengthen the downtown and, and what's defined as the central business district right now is the core downtown area. Um, and I, I think bringing more people living in into that core downtown will keep the downtown um, or will help to revitalize the downtown and, and keep the businesses in business. I, that that comment about more affordable housing is really important, and so if we can do more of that and get more people downtown, they'll spend money at the businesses. Well, you know, I agree with that in terms of development, but you know, I'm starting to see those buildings like 155 and then the, the Lumberyard building. If we had more of those buildings going down Pleasant Street, I don't think the planning board is taking into account parking. We're going to have an incredibly congested area with no, you know, this is not a city environment where people don't have cars. Everyone has cars. I, I just see it becoming a log jam. And I think it's not your purview, but I'm just saying, I think the planning board should take more consideration. When I see that in the Wombi Yard building, I just see cars spread out all over the back streets there. This is not going to be enough parking. Because every one of those units is going to have two cars. And that's something that I think urban planning is not taking into consider. It's not Manhattan. It's not a major metropolitan center where most people don't have cars. And I don't think you're going to change people's attitudes towards that in a community like ours. So that's probably for a whole other discussion. It, it is. I'm sorry. But I, it just bothers me a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it goes into the fact that if you're going to start putting theme buildings down King Street, you're developed. That's an issue that I don't think you or uh, people are really taking into consideration. That well, you're that, not changing that's, people's lifestyles. That's a whole other yeah, topic that has nothing okay. to do with right. our, our district. No. But, well, um, it does on what you're going to allow to be built there well, in but the so, future. So maybe there there has to be parking incorporated into into some of those buildings. Be, but that's not design. I mean, that'll yeah, be yeah, kind well. of the or, or another parking garage. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But form-based code is about urban planning. And I think it's a consideration. All right, so turning to, to Lower Pleasant Street, um, this is another between. This is another area that was added to your district. Um, clearly, you've had some influence here. My sense is that above Holyoke Street belongs in your district. Um, below Holyoke Street is currently general business district, so right at Holyoke Street, um, where that brick building is on the left, is on the other side of your line. So going down Pleasant Street, you've got Hugo's on one side, and then you get into a more eclectic mix below that. And there's 
former residential buildings on the left side and the um, commercial buildings set back from the street on the right. And then going down further, you get into the service center, the drive area with the DPH building and the parking lots and the hodgepodge of parking lots. So what would the form base code be for this area that's outside of this district but is part of the gateway into Northampton? So it would establish standards for the public realm that would require buildings. Establish standards for? It would establish standards for what's appropriate for sidewalks, the sidewalk widths. It would establish um, building setbacks. Building setbacks. Probably there would be a build to zone, a minimum and a maximum building setback. It would um, establish a minimum frontage occupancy. So basically, how much of your lot frontage has to be filled by a building within that build to zone. Um, it might have, it probably will have different allowed building types. Um, and there's some work there to figure out what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, I right, and right now it's basically absorbing what, what the standards are in the general business district. Right now it's basically. It's bas it would just take what's in the general business district and just incorporate that. The opportunity, I think, as Dylan is suggesting, is to add more detail that would actually say what you want beyond that, which I mean, right now it's, you can have, what, a 60-foot high building. It has to be, yeah, I don't remember the exact has to be fairly close to the street with the parking to the side and the rear. But otherwise, there's not a lot of guidance. Right. So and you could get something like the Atwood Drive buildings. You could get a beautiful building or not so beautiful building. You're not really saying what you want. Mm -hmm. Right, there's no, there are, there aren't any architectural design standards for this. There aren't any architectural design standards for this for right, anywhere. For the general to. business. So one approach would be to expand your district again to incorporate that and give you more meetings to go to. <laughs> the other would be to create more detailed standards that would then be part of the cookbook that mm -hmm. people would actually know what the city wants. I mean, it's the same thing with the, the northern district, the entryway yeah. business. So I, I would, you know, in just like, I, I think it would make sense to extend the street state scape standards north of Summer Street, but not the architecture standards. The same way I think it would make sense to extend the street state scape standards down to the rotary there, but I'm not sure the architecture standards should go, I don't know if I want them to go south of there, but it, at most I want them to go another, you know, to, is this Holyoke's? That's, That's uh, Hockenham. Hockenham. Yeah. I wouldn't want it to go past that. Mm -hmm. But I could see it going up to there. And again, just to encourage future development to be more like downtown. And I, so well, what about things like, like, um, let's see, this is a good example. Yeah. What about things like ratios of building heights to, height to width? Does that seem like something that is inappropriate in these two gateway districts or something like the a building have a having a base, a middle, and a top, or a limitation on blank walls, or requiring modulation of the facade over a certain length. These are all architectural design standards, right? Mm -hmm. um, well these are standards that aren't our cookbook standards. This is like so you're talking about creating a whole other set of architecture standards that aren't in our cookbook. Yeah, some of them are in our cookbook and some of them aren't. Right. Um, so you've got, you have things about windows in your standards that are pretty sensible about proportions of windows and separation of windows that, um, you know, if you follow them, you get a, a decent background building. If you want to build a contemporary building, you're going to have some problems with these standards, probably. You're going to have to. You're going to have some challenges with these standards right. if you want to build a contemporary building. Well, I, and I think that's, that's I know I, I wanted, at the session I went to that there was some comment about that, is that the central business architecture standards don't allow for contemporary buildings, which that's true, because we're trying to maintain that historic fabric. Mm -hmm. um, but so are there areas that are in downtown but not in the central business district where we want to allow for more modern architecture? Yeah, that's, that's a great that's segue to that's the other question we wanted to ask tonight. Is yeah, and what we heard at the, at the 
at the forum and so on was that these Lower Pleasant Street and Middle King Street are places where people seem more open to contemporary architecture. Um, some people are like really welcoming of it, and some people are like, yeah, maybe that would be okay. Um, I mean, I still wonder with that, do we leave it wide open or do we set some basic architectural standards? You know? So maybe maybe window separation between windows is a, is too much, but having a base. Well, you're also you're top also it's okay. You're also asking the question if it's if our if this is going to be in our district. Do we have two separate cookbooks for our district, or do we have, um, or if it's not going to be in our district, then we have to create a whole new um, way of dealing with building design for something that's not in our district. And I, I'm inclined. I mean, to me, it seems I'm not. I'm not sure I want to go. I'm not sure I want to add that layer of regulation farther away from the downtown. And, you know, I, I think the central business um, district is there so that when we're filling in the gaps between the historic buildings, what's coming in as new relates to those buildings. I don't know that by expanding down into areas that don't have those theme style buildings, are we just creating a false past? You know, are we creating a, a, a a Disneyland Main Street, um, or should we be looking at more contemporary architecture? I think it is, that becomes a whole other thing of, you know, is there a design review board that reviews some aesthetics? Um, I mean, alternatively, it could be a planning board that's, you know, if you have a basic form of elements that need to be included, and then the board is it? Proving so that it may not be detailed design, mm -hmm. but it's just ensuring that it you doesn't have that case. section. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. It also functions the way you want. Right. I mean, a yeah. lot of these stand. I mean, some of the standards are just aesthetic. Right. Like the corbeling and right. so on. But a lot of them are basic functions of how you make an active, walkable yeah. street, mm -hmm. where you want to have those a lot of transparency. You want to have a lot of active uses facing the sidewalk. Right. And I, I think that whole streetscape should extend as far as possible. I think we want to make Northampton as pedestrian bike friendly Yeah, I agree with possible. that. I mean, I think mm -hmm. setbacks and pedestrian paths should be more uniform mm -hmm. to create mm -hmm. a general look so you don't have all these staggered setbacks <laughs> and stuff. I, I definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I Me think too. there's room for contemporary architecture within that realm. Mm -hmm. right. You know, I don't think we should be aesthetically deciding what goes on there. Like you said, creating a false, you know, past. Mm -hmm. So I agree with that. Are there areas within the central business district we currently do have jurisdiction that you feel you could allow more contemporary architecture? Well the, the farther off Main Street we there we go, the more flexible we're gonna be. I mean, for example, um, Soot Jally's buildings um, if he had wanted to do those things you know, on here on Pleasant Street, it never would have happened. But where they are, you know, mm -hmm. we uh, we approved them. And Behind the Wood Star. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This, yeah. So in a four-base color approach, you would typically then carve out, you would have one sub-district sub which says, this is where we want to have the historic contextual buildings. And then you find other subdistricts. So that's where the black line and the dotted black line is. Right. So you would have other subdistricts that might be side streets or blocks. Well, what, he's, what he's talking about, though, is it's a little more complicated than that or subtle than that because it's visibility from a public way. So it's a right. back building. Yeah. It's, it's like they're, they're allowing this back building behind Woodstar because you can't see it from the public way, just like they're allowing the contemporary treatment to live 155 that you can't see from Pleasant Street. Or the other side of the lumber yard that you don't see from right well I guess that's the decision you have to make is so is it only the stuff that's not visible or is it stuff that's on like Holly Street or the back on Center Street or something that's yeah. not well, visible I think from we, the main we always drag. look at what's 
when we review the projects, it's always what is adjacent? What do you, how is this tying into the current fabric of architecture on those streets? And, and what is visible? Um, I think Live 155 is a good example of how it's tying in nicely with sort of the historic fabric, but then the back has a more contemporary look where it doesn't necessarily have to tie in with the fabric. And I think it, it's sort of, I don't know that I would make our district smaller at, at this point without like really looking at all the buildings on in, in each area. Um, Thinking back to your chart with the black lines on the street, I would, I would have Pleasant Street you know, between here and here probably be the solid black line, not the dotted black line. Mm -hmm. But and then the main street solid black line and everything else be the dotted black line. In terms of you know on where the solid black line is, you don't have much flexibility. But where the dotted black lines are, we're going to be more flexible with what you know the architecture type. The architecture, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does is that? I bring that up. Again. Yeah. Does it? So that's. That's basically how you guys are going to put things. That does what? Is that basically how you've been acting in practice? Is that on Main Street? I would say so. Lower King, you're more strict than on. on I would say streets? we've been. That's how yeah. we. Yeah, I'd say things. Pleasant Street and Main Street probably the most. And again, it's what's adjacent. What's right. it relating to? Right. I mean, it throws me no infill work that's ever going to be done on Main Street unless there's a major catastrophe. In I'm, terms I'm sorry, of, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I'm saying there's almost no infill that's ever going to happen on Main Street because it's developed unless there was a catastrophic building collapse or something no, like that. I, I, I can see the second, third story above faces, faces and CVS. And, and, right. Yeah, those Recreate the Draper Hotel. There you go. <laughs> All right. I would allow that. <laughs> Just a couple more of these to look through. So we did Pleasant Street. My, what I think I heard is keep it the way it is, possibly expand a little bit to the south. Um, I think, again, I think that's, you know, it's a gateway into town. A lot of people are getting off of the highway. I think that deserves more, um, you know, guidance um, from this committee. While, while we can't, while we have the opportunity, I don't think it's a bad thing to take advantage of that. Yeah, what I hear your colleagues design drawing a distinction between having more guidance for applicants and this committee providing that guidance. So I think the distinction there is this committee has a very specific purview, which is basically historic preservation um, and maintenance of the central business, central business district. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so there can still be guidelines for architecture in other parts of town, but that doesn't mean that it's the purview of this committee because it's not about historic preservation in other parts of town, like here on Common Street. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to have architectural guidelines for other parts of town, then that requires a whole other layer of regulation, right? Mm -hmm. Which, uh, well, it does, it doesn't. If you go back to that last slide, I mean, right now on Con Street, the zoning that's in place is an architectural guideline. It does. It just doesn't give you much information to go on. Uh -huh. um, so what you just, what you would be adding to that is just to say what you want, uh -huh. and not just leave it to chance. Right? So it's not really adding a whole lot more regulation, in my mind. I mean, here it's. I, I think. Well, what do you have to do? So then, does the planning board get to? Um, regulate what the building looks like, which I don't think it does now, right? Or does it? There are aspects that the planning board can regulate. There are what? There are elements that the planning board can regulate, and again, it's based on context. Mm -hmm. So um, typically they don't get into the um, de level of detail that you all do about those elements, uh -huh. and they're more, they're much broader. Um, but, you know, I think the form-based code can address, so let's take the Gazette as an example, where there are no windows. <laughs> I mean, no windows, but you can't see them. Um, and um, if a setback, um, you know, there could be more 
features that are added to the form based code that say you know you have to have um, so it wouldn't be complicated for the planning board to administer that right yeah I mean there there are plenty of places out there communities run the range from anything goes to highly detailed and you can do what you want there are trade-offs to both you will get more of what you want if you're more detailed it may have cost implications for projects. It's going to require more board review time. It might require longer permitting. But if Northampton cares about something, it can do it. Well, I, I was just going to reiterate that I think, again, this is a, an example where if it is a more pedestrian friendly space, people would walk up and down it. There'd be more activity on the street. Now it's it's not a friendly space to be right. in. So codes that emphasize that are good in this whole downtown area. But I don't think you necessarily have to dictate what the building looks like. If that building were brought up to the street, would we require something on that first level that was more active or transparent or something that made it a friendlier building to somebody yeah. walking by? So that's, so that's, that's the... I mean, if you were building that today, what you would require is you know, put the put the office and the lobby and stuff on the street yep. so it has a nice facade right. and put your warehouse and printing plant in the back, mm -hmm. yeah. put the parking in the yeah. back. It would right. be very easy to do that. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, in this case, you would put those basic standards in as the things that support the life of the street, the pedestrian friendliness, right. and then let them go to town with the architecture and do right. something interesting and sure. delightful. Yeah. I feel like it would be important to establish the building setbacks, the pedestrian and passageways, you know, sidewalk spaces. Mm -hmm. But like you said, have sub districts in terms of the architectural review. So that in the long run, in a hundred or two hundred years, like the Pleasant Street corridor continues further down even if the buildings initially don't meet an architectural aesthetic, you, you're, you're determining the limits so that when they get replaced in the future, you're creating a longer corridor that's representative of our cityscape. And the same on the extension of King Street too, and stop it at those areas. So that, like I said, in the long view, as things turn over, and they will get bigger buildings, they will get infilled, You've, you've established that roadway. That's an aesthetic that we want to mm -hmm. encourage. That's my feeling. A um, couple of things that I noticed in looking at the map. Um, well, so there's another one, which is Holly Street. This came up in our public forum, people talking about Holly Street as a redevelopment opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, the north portion of Holly Street is in, in your districts. The south portion of Holly Street is not in your district. So this is in your district. Yeah, and across the street, the church, right? Yeah, and across the street. Is the trust building in the district? I think so. We reviewed okay. it, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. It is? I thought it was just north of it. We, we okay. reviewed it. Okay, so then it ends just south of the trust mm -hmm. building. Then you get into this area, which is more. I'm, I can't hear anything. Sorry. You get into the middle, which is residential. Um, and then the south end of Holly Street is desperate. desperate right. <laughs> right. So, do you feel like your the dividing line there is appropriate for you guys, as it is? So, you reviewed this building. Yep. And it's an anomaly. We so did an anomaly. We just called it an anomaly. And it was a renovation, so that? it was yep. pre-existing. Maybe I wasn't but it was it was all blank facades because it was a it was a lumber mill basically. Right. It was, so this was an incredible improvement to an existing building, right. making it much more lively and open and seeing activity on the street. Um, but there was nothing immediately adjacent. It wouldn't make sense to sheath it in brick or. But it creates a setback that kind of falls into what I think you're talking about in 
terms of the building setbacks. Mm -hmm. So I can see that being extended down that street, yeah. but at this point not regulate the architecture, but just now right the now, zoning, the just street. the zoning, yeah, yeah, the setbacks. Right now the lower end of the street is in, what a so kind industrial. Of industrial district, uh, and then there's that area that's residential that sort of comes across. <laughs> oh, these are the big parking lot areas? Right. The, yeah. the shoe guy? Yeah. Okay. And it's in CES. And it's a district that's essentially was designed to allow mill renovation, what I can see. It basically, it looks like it's designed for adaptive reuse. Yeah, I mean, there's a problem there. In the, I mean, we've talked about rezoning into central business. Um, the issue, there, there's some infrastructure issues, too, on the site um, mm. that um, really would, the criteria should at least enable, encourage development to happen at the street because there's a, but there's, um, there, it's the same problem as at the lumber yard. There's a huge storm drain that runs through the property. That's correct, right? There's yeah, 150 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so to the extent that it would allow you to build on the street, that would could accommodate that issue. Um, and not that you can't do that in the current zoning, but. Um, those are one of the, that's some of the problem on that property in particular why it's just a wide open parking lot. But so the what's the allowable, um, what can be built there now? Offices, I mean you can go up to four stories, um, but it's industrial, so no residential. Well you could do residential above, but not many people are doing that when combined with office space. Uh -huh. So back office, um, you know, R&D, marijuana testing labs, <laughs> marijuana production, <laughs> um, all the new uses. To me, it's a weird part of town. It, it seems like it should be a residential area, mm -hmm. especially with the divider of the, the train there and all those neighborhoods. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it should be an industrial Zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and what it seems to be attracting is uses that want to have a lot of parking nearby, right? Or so that's just, I mean, I don't know that that parking gets used, does it? Well, right? yeah, this parking gets used by CES, which is just off the screen. So CES built a building relatively recently. Which one is CES? Collaborative for Educational Services. It's a yellow building. It's set back. Okay. It's got front parking and then like a. They use that for parking. This they way. use this as overflow parking. Um, so there's an office building next, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. next to it, yeah. and then you've got the Arts Trust, which has a fair amount of parking. Mm -hmm. So, in some ways, it seems like it's. I think there's a possibility that it's trending towards. Possibility that, that it's trending towards office uses that or other uses that want on street parking but also want proximity to downtown. You that want off street parking. Off street parking. Yeah. Right. Are there any other specific uh, yep. questions or issues you want us to talk about? Yeah, so this one, New South Street, just this building is not in your district. Really? That seems strange to me. Yeah. This building is not in your district. Yeah. That seems strange to me. Um, so just to flag those. And then Con Street. Um, the Maplewood shops are in your districts. And then the first couple of buildings there on Con Street are also in your district, basically down to Paradise Copies. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've done a review there, and I don't know if you feel like that's appropriate to be in the district or not. So this area here, the Dairy Mart, that's sort of like retrofitted triple decker there, that's the second building on the right. And that's in the district. That's in the central business district. Just the right. So it may make sense again to sort of look at this as a corridor but not 
um, you know, for those corridor standards, but not necessarily Central Business Architecture Review. Right, but it's predominantly residential, once you, with the exception of Paradise Copies. That's predominantly a residential street. Well, so you've you got the realtor office and the yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, well, it's kind of like the section of King Street, right, yeah. where you have residential buildings that are transitioning to office uses because yeah. there's a hell of a lot of traffic, and so. Well, again, I think it's the same thing I it said is, before. It is a huge high traffic area here. It's just what I said before too. I just think it's important to establish the setbacks that are consistent in the pedestrian ways, so that eventually the new infill maintains that, and you're not getting that staggered building you know then like i said in 100 or 20 years it'll even itself out with new development that's so it sounds i, I don't know if we can regulate that area at this point from an architectural standpoint yeah. yeah well you currently do well just but not up the whole to the corridor. Dairy. no yeah right well, to paradise copies right so it sounds like you're all comfortable with stronger streetscape standards yeah. I would yes. say so. Yes. All the specific guidelines for the sidewalks and the plantings and so mm -hmm. on. So that's good. <laughs> um, but I think that's all stuff that's pretty clearly, it's pretty easy to make it very objective too. Yeah. And the other thing that I've heard tonight is pretty much leave your, your, that your jurisdiction makes sense and that you all pretty much feel like it should stay the way it is. I think you should add, I'm surprised that the Sullivan School building is not, you know, I don't know if that's part of the So the Sullivan School, school is, it's the Holly Grammar, the one Holly that's Grammar expressed. School yeah. should, should be in it, and I think that, I think the, up to, uh, Old South Street. To the apartment building? Yeah, that, that should probably all be central business up and down here. Cause yeah, here. I would, I, I could see adding this to the central business. I think if, the reason it's not in there had something to do with when the business improvement district was formed. And this was definitely put into central business because of the bid. Um, uh -huh. And it's, uh, but it, it doesn't make sense for this one not to be. In the That's district. been in the that central business a, district longer than the hmm? bid. That was it. That goes way back before the bid. No, well, the Forbes Library Forbes. The, was put in. Oh, I thought you were talking about bid. the schools. Um, but, the, yeah. but the school, well, the I. Yeah, I'm not sure, yeah. but that you would think that should be in the central business. I think the area. other one that's residential on the other side of the bridge, um, on the other side of Clark. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's all residential. That other building you showed. Oh, it's all residential. The other one has some commercial. This one, right. right. So this one, you know, we allow those kinds of densities in urban residential C, which is the district in which it lies. So okay. I almost think that it's a good transitional property to that lower density residential behind it and down. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't, wouldn't necessarily encourage that to, to transition to commercial uses, so mm -hmm. which a central business district would be sort of setting that policy goal that we want to transition that to some more commercial use instead of residential. So, so is that why that that old school is not in the district because it's all residential now? Uh, well, it could be. I mean, when it was first redeveloped, I think that was all. I think the plan was the one building was going to be mixed use and the other building was going to be all residential, and that may have been the point at which. The zoning was extended to include the main school building, mm -hmm. but not the grammar school piece of it. I don't know. I mean, that was probably in the 80s when that happened, so I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, I think the old school, the the D.S. Sullivan School, I think was in the original district. Yeah. Um, but I think they split the parcel going back before that, so in the 80s when the redevelopment of the site was first um, considered. All right. So, so that's the only expansion is that one. <laughs> yeah. um, so we've covered the district boundaries. Is there anything in your standards that you feel like should be applied elsewhere in town? No. I wouldn't want to impose our standards on places outside that are currently outside of the district. It's, it's, there's not a good reason for it, I don't think. Well, I think there should be a some, some sort of a design review 
um, just sitting on the I'm history. sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I think that there should be some sort of design review for those areas that you don't want to have come under the purview of, um, you know, central business. Just because just sitting on the historic commission, um, you know, people, you know, the demolition review, the demolition review um, comes into play. Does it come into play here? You no, don't have a demolition, we, have demolition. The demolition review is everywhere except central business. Oh, it's everywhere except. And okay. we have purview over it in central business. Okay. All right. Okay. But I just think some sort of design review is important. So because you get people who, you know, they're more interested in making, you know, profit and maximizing, you know, living space and apartments at the expense of neighborhoods. Um, and you have, and you end up, you know, you could end up with something that looks like a hotel or motel, um, you know, surrounded by residential residences and without some sort of design review that's going to be allowed to happen and you just kind of you lose the scale of, um, of, of, the, of a neighborhood, which I think is important. And I'm not saying that we're the ones who should be doing the design review. I just think there should be some sort of a committee that does, that does design review, um, you know, perhaps in, you know, in these areas that don't come under um, uh, central that and aren't part a, of a historic whole, district that aren't part of a that's a whole other thing for city council yeah, to well. deal with that yeah you know, once you get probably in, be, sorry, it's, it's not our I, yeah. question yeah I mean once you get into exclusively residential zoning I don't think you can regulate that. Mm -hmm. I think it's like First Amendment rights or something. Well, we try, you know, yeah. whatever. Well, you know what I mean? Just trying to guide it along. Um, you know, it's like just. It's um, really. I was just pointing the but like that, the yellow house that wanting to buy well, on Bridge, uh, was that, uh, Adair. Prospect Street yeah. by you. Um, you know, I mean, oh boy. boy, that's an anomaly. Oh, yeah. that's <laughs> you can't. Tell people not to build a house to their right. side. Well, you know? I know that, but <laughs> you, can, right. you can't try to guide them, and you can delay what they're taking down in hopes that they will be more agreeable, more amenable, you know, to a better design. What about the blue barracks, one half block down? What's wrong with that? Nobody complains. I'm about sorry. That. What? Um, <laughs> yeah. The blue box that's just half a block down from the yellow one. Yeah. I used to be yeah. have an ice cream. Yeah. Have an ice cream. Oh, yeah. Place. That's horrible. It's mostly the paint. That's also uh, across the street from the Y. Yeah. It's on the corner of Jackson right. and Prospect. Anyway. All right. Well, thank you guys for your time. I think we've covered everything we were hoping to. So, when do we get to actually see the draft code? Probably the middle of next month. Well, yeah. So, and what's the process for reviewing and approving it? We're hoping to have a couple of public forums between in July and August, and then um, then it will go into the full. You know, if, if the city decides to move forward, then it would go through the normal planning board and city council. And all that. Yeah, I can't hear you. It will go through the whole zoning review process. So. And then eventually come before city council. Yeah. But we're going to meet with the planning board next week and okay. sort of gauge their level of comfort with the initial draft and then see where they want to go. So just to be clear again, um, we're not getting rid of the central business architecture guidelines, or we are? I mean, that's, not a, that's a policy decision that's not in our hands to make. Okay. I don't think that, I mean, we're not recommending. I mean, the, the, the code incorporates most, you know, all of the objective standards right. that are in your current guidelines. Okay. So it's not really replacing it. Hopefully it's making it well, easier for people to interpret it. That, that's what I wanted to know. Straight. You're folding it into the yeah. form-based code. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's basically absorbing everything that we can. And so that's kind of the... But there may be more elements that will be, that will um, eliminate the requirement for them to come before you. Sure. If it's, you know, all written out and you can do, you know, here's the way I can get through to my building permit without coming to the committee, and here are the ways that if I want to modify, I have to come to the committee. 
So there, by by do by incorporating those design elements into the code, we may be able to sort of um, winnow the number of projects that need review. So will we have an opportunity to review <coughs> a draft and provide comment? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a while before it comes up for any kind of adoption. Okay. As Dylan said, it's going to be public hearings. And, but first, a lot of internal reviews. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I, just, uh, I, mean, I guess I should say that I appreciate what you guys do. And yeah. As a resident of Northampton, like, I'm thankful that there are people that are watching the city and making sure that good things get built. And I think that there's, you know, I can see clear evidence of you guys being effective in, in the new buildings on Pleasant Street and in the renovations on King Street and elsewhere in town. So, thank you. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Well, thanks for all the work that you're doing. Well, it's, like it's an interesting process because there's a sort of national model for four max codes. But wherever we go, <laughs> how it actually would be ideal to fit really depends on local capacity, mm -hmm. local staff. Sure. In some cities, they will have like an architect on staff whose job it is to interpret the four max code and work with the applicants. But if you don't have an architect on staff, you can't do that. Right. Um, you have volunteer committees versus professionals, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is trying to feel our way over what's going to be the best fit to actually make your jobs easier, make the result better. Well, and I think ultimately... We don't know exactly what that is yet. We want to be friendly to development right. within certain guidelines. Right. right. And then there's this ongoing question of how we promote interesting and exciting new architecture mm -hmm. without spoiling what we know and love. Right. Which, uh,